Hi, this is Inspiring Honesty, and I'm your host, Greg Bray, and I'm an atheist. I'm here today. I'll be joined again by Bob Graves, and I, I don't have a guest for the day. I wanted to make sure that we kept it open because I had an opportunity last night to meet up with a guest that had been on our show. Um, I'm, I apologize. That's on my end. It looks we had a smoke alarm go off, and my wife is cooking. That's not anything that is surprising, but um, I'm <clears throat> sorry. And I love you. Uh, but I, I had an opportunity last night to meet with Eric Hovind, who was on the show about six weeks ago. He was in Green Bay, which is about a half hour away from where I live, by, uh, or a half hour drive. And he presented at a um, an event called Creation Quest. Uh, this was uh, – he, he invited me to come along with him. I, my brother and I went there, and I had no idea what it was going to be like. I walked in completely blind. Um, I knew that there was a dinner involved and that there were three other speakers. Um, he was joined with or by Kabir Baha Biamila, who is a former Green Bay Packers player. Um, Jay Siegert, who is part of the I want to make sure I'm getting the name right here, the Creation Education Center based out of uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, um, which is about two hours away from where I live. And then also Mike LeMay, who was the, the MC of the night. Um, he is the station director for Q90, which is a Christian radio station in the area um, that uh, is very, very popular. And they're actually the ones who put on this event in the first place. Um, it was a fantastic experience. This uh, was the first opportunity. Um, excuse me. Sorry, I had to send a message there. Um, this was the first opportunity that I had to uh, meet face to face with Eric Hovind and uh, and really the first event of its kind I've ever personally attended. I've never been to a revival meeting. I've never been to um, a faith healing seminar, uh, any, any any sort of major rally of this kind. I, uh, other than this, I've been to church services and youth groups. Um, and it was, it was eye-opening in many ways. It was a great experience. And frankly, what I really liked about it is I made sure I wore my, my Richard Dawkins out campaign pin to the meeting. Um, and I... Uh, was not shy about who I was, why I was there. I mean, I was there on invite, not crashing this party. So I figured if the the featured speaker wanted me to be there, then that should be the case. Um, and I, I made my story very clear. And I was amazed by how welcoming everybody was and how much I, everything was um, completely open and on the table, how warm. Uh, and it, it was certainly interesting to get reactions from people and to see – their faces when I said, oh, I'm an atheist. And they went, oh, I, I, I kept it. My brother was with me. He was my cameraman and uh, just did not want to use the camera very much. So I do have a couple of pictures um, that I'll, I'll be bringing up here shortly. But uh, um, the, the event was fantastic. So I just want to give a, a brief rundown. Um, first of all, when I arrived there, I met uh, Eric Hovind for the first time um, again. And we, we did have an opportunity for a photo op uh, that is um, 1368, Joey, if you can show that one. Uh, it's, this is me um, meeting Eric when I came into uh, the, the the event. He was luckily right at the entryway because he uh, he was the one that had the tickets on hold for us. So um, I didn't have to, to look for him or anything. It was really nice. And I, I don't know if the picture shows there were um, deer uh, there as well, which was interesting to say the least. Um, there is a... Um, ministry of sorts that uh, goes on um, in in the Green Bay area that that uses these very very large antler deer to open the door to talk about God. So that that was interesting. Um, if nothing else, it didn't bring a, a it was not a major featured thing of the event, more just they were one of the sponsors that was there. Um, but uh, I, I learned some things about deer. Uh, last night, and I can say that at the very minimum, I can walk away saying that I learned that. But um, I didn't realize when I had arrived that this was a, a full dinner event with a, everybody was sitting at tables, round tables of eight. And um, as a guest of Eric's, I had the opportunity to sit at the main table, my brother and I, with um, Mike LeMay, the MC, with Eric, and with uh, Jay Siegert. Um, KGB did join us for a bit, but he has a family with six children, uh, so he had a table all by himself, one one right over. So um, it, it was fantastic. We we watched the the program opened up with um, KGB giving a speech uh, about 
his experiences in um, coming to Jesus and and really interlacing that with his experience as a Packer player. I thought, you know, as a non-Christian, um, I thought his speech was very motivational. He talked a lot about looking at the Bible as a playbook and, and how important it is to not only study the playbook, but to implement it properly and to understand it. Um, and I thought that was a fantastic point. Um, he, he said that uh, it's not enough to just know what it says, but to actually act upon it. As a believer, that's, that's very important. If you're going to be playing on the team, you need to know what the playbook says. Um, that, uh, that was our, um, it, it was, first of all, uh, one of my first times meeting, a one of the Green Bay Packers. Now I'll say I'm not a huge Packer fan, but, uh, um, it's always striking to me to be next to a professional sports player because, uh, I'm not tall and they generally are. Um, so there was that, but he was just an engaging guy, a very, a very personable. Um, I really liked him, and it was fantastic. I played a pickup game of football with my friends this morning, um, and I invited him to come along, but unfortunately he had other obligations that it was a Sunday morning. So um, I would have had more pictures of that. Uh, then um, after KGB talked, we moved on, and it was uh, Jay Seeger. Now, I had never met Jay before, but I'd seen – um, some of his publications and seen his name about, um, I did, I had an opportunity to pick up his book, uh, that it's out about three weeks ago. Um, let there be light is the name of the book. Uh, he's signed it for me here. Um, quoted, uh, Jeremiah thirty two seventeen in there. I had to look that one up because I figured it was going to be uh, a fool says in his heart that, uh, there is no God, but no, no, that is the, uh, the scripture that talks about, um, why it, uh, or, or talks about the creation of the world so unfortunately i didn't have that one memorized walking into it i do have a picture of meeting jay as well um and uh his speech is also uh, the speech that he did um it was uh, i believe the title was evolution um problematic or um, i'm sorry i'm I'm drawing a blank on the, the name of the speech. I don't have it written down, but it actually is available. If you Google his name, uh, just Jay Seeger, that's S-E-E-G-E-R-T, um, it's available online. Uh, you can watch the, the whole presentation on YouTube. So that's, that was interesting. Um, it's about a half hour long. I have to say, uh, as a biologist there, um, he was speaking in very, very great detail about the theory of evolution and strongly misrepresenting that he's not uh, explicitly an expert. He was a computer programmer in his life before uh, he went full-time into this ministry. So I can't blame him entirely, but uh, I, I'd love to have him on sometime and talk about that. And uh, we did talk about the opportunity for him to come on the show um, in the future as well. So um, after that, we broke for a an hour and a half to mingle and to eat. And that was fantastic. That was when I had the opportunity to sit with Eric and Jay and Mike LeMay um, and – their other respective guests and have some conversations uh, from a, a very, very open perspectives that I was not necessarily expecting, but with them asking me questions, me asking them questions. And I thought they made some very good points. Um, one of them, uh, and this is both Jay and Eric made this point during their, their performances was about um, worldviews and how we look at the world in one way or another. Um, and that is the filter through which we see everything. Um, their basic premise is that if you don't look through things from a biblical worldview, you'll never see things um, in a biblical way. And I, I tend to agree with that. I thought that was a marvelous point. Um, they also brought up uh, the book of Genesis, why they are young earth creationists, why they believe that the earth is 6,000 years old and that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. Um, and that is that if we can't trust God on Genesis, um, how can we trust any of the Bible? Um, specifically using the quote from, I believe it was Jay's son or Jay's daughter who said, uh, well, when does the Bible start telling the truth? And I, I thought that was uh, an interesting point to say the least, but, um, I think that most people would agree that, uh, it's rather, um, evident where, where the authors of the Bible were trying to be, uh, literal on it and not. And I do not see Genesis to be in it, even an attempt at a literal account, but, um, that's, you know, that, that is where they come from. And I think that is a respectful position. Um, after dinner, we had, uh, Eric, um, did his speech and 
that was that was entertaining. He talked about um, evolution, the theory of evolution, uh, and very specifically had a list of lies that that biologists and that scientists tell people. Um, and it was it was a lot of fun because he went through. He's a, a great speaker, very animated, very um, entertaining, and it was fun to watch. Um, he, he, I was I was blown away with how engaging he is. I wish I had that kind of talent, but um, he uh, when he was done with the speech. He sat down back next to me, and it was it was interesting because uh, sitting right next to me, he leaned over and he said, "Wow, it's it's a little awkward to sit down next to an atheist after that, <laughs> after saying all of that." And uh, um, you know, I, I had to point out that I'm not just an atheist; I'm also an evolutionary biologist. So um, uh, that was uh, a fun point of the night. I, it was nice to to come into it with our. Uh, a, a very um, fun attitude between each other and, and not uh, combative in any way. And of course, then there was like or Mike LeMay, um, who he was just the MC for the night, did not do much of his own presentation, did talk a little bit. But um, I'm really excited about that one as well. He runs uh, one of the Christian stations in the area. Um, it was uh, the, full of questions. Um, and uh, it, I may very well be appearing on his radio show in the future or one of the shows on his station um in the near future so we're working on coordinating that and of course i'll let you know before that happens um because that is broadcast online and i'll uh, make sure that that comes out to any of our viewers so you know when to watch or listen as it were um the last thing i want to say before i bring bob onto the show is that uh jay asked me a question during dinner um jay said uh hey, when we were talking about the the question of worldviews he asked me uh, when I, I said that I, I agree with that, um, but I think that my worldview is from a, a scientific, it is an evidence-based worldview that I see things, that the worldview I, I see things as is that things should have evidence um, to be justifiably believed. And uh, his question from that was, what kind of evidence could make you believe in a God? It could prove to you that, that there is a God. Of course, my first response to that is nothing proves a positive, but I did come up with a little bit of a list for um, that which I thought would be um, very compelling, to say the least, for me. And I wanted to share that, and then we'll bring Bob onto the show. Uh, the first one here is a rapture. Um, you know, these uh, this group very strongly does believe that at the return of Christ, uh, the true believers will be um, instantly raptured into um, heaven and will disappear, infants out of wombs or fetuses out of wombs, um, the children disappearing, the empty cars, empty airplanes, pilots gone missing, straight out of the Left Behind series. That would be pretty compelling to me. I'm not going to lie. Um, it'd be, be real hard for me to, to see that in any way, particularly given the way that it's been predicted. And that leads into the next point. Um, predictions, uh, prophecies. Now, there are prophecies in the Bible. There's plenty of things that are said to be projected into the future, a prediction. Uh, and then there's times that it is fulfilled in the Bible, um, which I think that that speaks to itself in some ways. Now, obviously, um, that's that's a little tongue-in-cheek, that they're written in different books and it's fulfilled, but I, the, those who were writing the Bible were familiar with these prophecies. And even then, um, in almost every case, there was not a single prophecy in the Bible that they said, well, we know that this is going to happen here in this place at this time. What they did is they looked back and said, well, this was obviously the fulfillment of that prophecy. Um, what I mean when I say prophecy is if somebody said on October 24th of 2013, there will be a massive earthquake. You don't need to tell me a place. You don't need to tell me a time. Um, but say a day, a specific, at, at least that level of specificity, and say this earthquake will kill between 100,000 and 103,000 people. Still, that's a 3,000-person window. That's specific enough. That would be pretty compelling to me that this person had some sort of knowledge of the, the future. And uh, that, at the very minimum, uh, would be compelling. Uh, there's also a scripture in Mark, um, and it's mentioned in a few other uh, of the, the books of the Bible. But it says that the signs of believers, uh, being able to take up serpents in their hands, drink poison, and not be harmed by it. Um, speak in tongues, then be uh, new tongues, 
and tongues that are understood, are understood by anybody who listens, no matter what their native tongue is, um, as in the first Pentecost, um, heal the sick. Uh, that's uh, another one that the true believers should be doing. And I'll tell you what, there are uh, faith healing seminars, but I have never once seen an amputee regrow a limb at one of those or um, a, a horribly disfigured person have their scars removed. Um, that would be compelling. And uh, the last one, of course, uh, would be the appearance of God directly. Um, I'm not going to deny things when they're staring me in the face. Um, and uh, obviously there'd be some scrutiny. Somebody claiming to be God doesn't necessarily mean to be God. And, and even if it was appearing only to me, I'd, I'd be pretty dubious. Uh, I, I'd probably cons- think that I've gone crazy. Um, and, and I look for consensus for other people. But if enough people are seeing this, and if this it has some sort of special abilities, and um, that would be pretty compelling to me. And the last one is, of course, um, the implantation of knowledge. Uh, if, if this God did appear and said, here, um, a- anybody who's seen Star Wars, or not Star Wars, sorry, excuse me, Star Trek, has seen the Vulcan mind melt. Um, if this God were to say, here, now you know, and to implant knowledge into me, these are signs, these are ways that I, as an atheist, could easily be converted. Um, and what was interesting is when they had asked me that, and I was able to give them those answers. And I said, so, what could change your mind? And their answer <laughs> was absolutely nothing. Um, on that note, I wanted to uh, say, Bob, thank you for bearing with me. Bob listens when I'm on my uh, monologues here. So um, thank you for bearing with me, and welcome to the show. Um, it's good to have you. Thank you, Greg. And I, I just wanted to say w- one thing. Hold on a second. that. Greg, I hope you're listening. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have told me it was you that needed to say that. <laughs> I just, just, like, there's somebody I just, who wants to say something here. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Hey, good to talk to you. I'm glad you had a chance to see this. And um, uh, it, it is impressive sometimes. I've been to a number of these you know, kinds of events, uh, not, not necessarily a creation event, but, but other – uh, and, and sometimes when people get together from far and wide, it can be a ton of fun, lots of great food, and people are usually in an excellent mood. The food was fantastic, and yeah, people were very, very friendly. I really was impressed with uh, with the crowd there and how open and welcome they were to me, who was, I mean, a pretty. I have been described by uh, – Many people or, or atheists in general have been described as evil and deceitful and dangerous to allow near your children. Uh, so I, I was impressed. Yeah. Um, I, I also I wanted to mention I, I missed the the opportunity to do our Halloween special, um, and I, I have not seen that posted yet. So I, I look forward to that. Bob, what what were your your thoughts on that revival you think oh uh, i was- i didn't get a chance to see it i you know i was just sitting here behind the camera i never got a chance to see it but my wife was watching from the other room and she was laughing her fool head off she thought it was funny and maybe it's a good thing you weren't there because if you had been there for it you'd have been going to this uh this little revival thing saved <laughs> <laughs> right, that, that would have been wrong, you know. It, it would have... <laughs> no, we well, we had a good time, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing the video because um, my wife is telling me that I really missed what it was like to see uh, Michael Jones and and even Rhonda and the way everyone was behaving. But I tell you, we we had a blast. It was fun. We we're just I was just going by the cuff. If we had it to do over again, if we'll do it, something like this next year, I. I'm prepared to even, you know, pull out more stops. But we had some fun. It was. I'll plan around that fun. next year. That's <laughs> this year <laughs> was short notice. I uh, unfortunately already had plans and was not able to, to change that. Man, I'm I'm sad that I missed that. That would have been two two revivals for an atheist in one week. I I could have been this saved. Would twice. have prepared you. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Uh, Bob, I wanted to ask your opinion uh, on that one. I know that we've talked a bit in the past um, uh, about uh, your your understanding that your beliefs are not necessarily compelling. But um, what what is your take on some of their arguments about the worldview and uh, you know trusting things in the Bible? Um, that, that if you can't trust every single word of it, how can you trust any of it? 
I, oh, of course, I, your I, even though I'm a theist, even though I would call myself a follower of Christ, um, I, I certainly don't share that belief with them. I, you know, this text was written by people, uh, some of it more, you know, 2,000 years ago, some of it uh, even farther back than that. And, uh, you know, as I read this text, I do not see anything that tells me these people were in any way ahead of their time. Uh, and I, you know, I also see s several problems with it that I think a person has to be dishonest about, or, or at least um, it, it makes me, um, you know, when I see these people sometimes who really believe that everything in the Bible somehow is very consistent and very infallible, and yet I'm looking at certain aspects of it that I find to be uh, textually obviously human, I it makes me wonder how they have to distort their perspective to to actually even think that way. I I, I do see the the biblical text as being important, as being significant, as being a testimony of sorts. But just like if you've ever been at a, a trial uh, in sitting in the jury and uh, two or three different witnesses to a particular event might speak up. You know, you can decide that an event happened based on the testimony of these people, even though you're under the impression these people certainly saw it through their own eyes in a way that made sense to them. And and I think that in many ways, we have a lot of the texts of the Bible that, that come across that way, that uh, things were said, conclusions held on to, and ideas entertained that were just ideas that made sense to them. And um, so I, I think if you're going to have a worldview where you have to filter everything through the Bible, you can't make much progress uh, for what we've done in the last, you know, 2,000 years. You're, you're stuck in the past, and the, basically you're ignoring so much that, that the human uh, race has learned. I, I, I just can't entertain that notion. You know, I, I, I had that very same question when I was talking with them at dinner um, about – the biblical worldview and about you know, circular reasoning, which Eric uh, and I had talked about, or we, we had all talked about, obviously, when he was on the show, um, and how it's if you start with the assumption that God is real and God wrote the Bible and that the Bible is the inherent word of God, um, or, well, God inspired the writing of the Bible and it's the inerrant word of God, um, then there's absolutely no way to disprove that. that that's the, if that's your starting place, there's... Hey, there's no way for that to not be true in your eyes. And uh, I think that, uh, that that speaks volumes about how difficult these conversations can be and also how important they can be. Um, I, what I'd, I'd love to see is a conversation between um, somebody that takes that position and somebody who takes the exact same position with a different religious text. Um, say, for example, even a, just a different translation of the same religious text, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. Um, or uh, if we had a um, a Muslim imam speaking about their, uh, I mean, it would need to be a very fundamental uh, worldview. But um, yeah, you know, and and I brought that up, and the thing that uh, the thing that Eric said is that he is happy to come and bring his message to different places, uh, but. He does not think that he would ever. Uh, this is when we were talking about having me on the Christians, or Christian network, or the Christian radio station. He said he doesn't think that he would do that and invite an atheist onto his show because uh, when you already know the truth, what's the purpose to entertaining contradictory ideas? And I, I didn't know how to respond to that one. Um, I, I guess. That's that's a solid um, understanding of uh, the truth, um, but but how do you know? And he actually he went into that during his presentation. Um, this is the same point that he talked about during our show, and he was trying to work to is that knowledge. And he used actually the same analogy of the one percent uh, of all knowledge. If you know one percent of all knowledge, um, or you think you know that, is it possible that something in the other ninety nine percent of knowledge is going to disprove? one percent of or the one percent that you think you know and uh, you know the obvious conclusion of that is sure yeah absolutely there are things that can be known um that with absolutes but those are deductive reasoning um a, anything inductive is certainly replaceable in that way um and uh, his 
his argument as it came to its full culmination that we never got to um, on, on the show, we just ran out of time, was that what it boils down to is there's only one way to know anything. That, uh, to know it, and he's using the definition of knowledge as absolute, to know it without a doubt and to be 100% sure. There are two ways that that can be the case. The first one is to know everything. If you know everything, you can, you can state unequivocally that, that you know any single thing because it's not possible that some new information will come around that will show that to not be true. Um, the other side of that is the or, or the, the other way to do it is to know somebody who knows everything. And that would be the appeal um, that if since God is omnipotent uh, or an omniscient, knows everything, then as long as you know God and you know that God wrote this book, then, then you can know anything. You can know whatever God has told you. Um, and I, I think that the fundamental flaw to that argument, um, and I, I'm hoping Eric is in town until Wednesday, so we're uh, going to be coordinating um, a meeting where I can interview him again and, and have uh, something recorded uh, for, for posterity's sake. We may just put that right up on YouTube or it may become integrated into a show. But I'm hoping to discuss with him um, that that still presupposes that you have the knowledge of God, um, that unless you know that you know somebody that knows everything and you know that that somebody knows everything, uh, and you know that that somebody always tells the truth, then it's not possible to know anything with absolute knowledge. And that if it's possible to know those things without that being given to you from God, then then there's it's possible to know anything else. So it's it's a self defeating argument in that way. But uh, um, well, I think there's other problems too. I mean, for example, where um, where the biblical text says, you know, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor you know, my ways your ways, and uh, there is uh, there appears to be uh, certain teachings from the Bible that would even teach that we, you know, even if God did know everything, uh, and He were to actually tell you something that is something He knows, there is no guarantee that you have the capacity to truly understand it for what it is as it was expressed. So um, there's a – one of the flaws that I see in the fundamentalist mindset is that they're, they do not see there being any steps between an idea being taught and understanding it. That to them, if, if a truth has been preached, there you go. You have it. And um, – and the the idea that our perspective or our um, our way of understanding or uh, any biosemiotic uh, element has anything to do with it all is something that seems to be totally absent. There's just this straightforward assumption that all, all ideas that are known are just simply ideas, and once they're known, you know them. Period. And t to me, that's a very um, it's a very elementary. Uh, kind of almost a um, uh, you know a primary uh, view of knowledge. You know, I, I just I and and I think that you know you didn't become a biologist by sitting in class and hearing certain things and just knowing them perfectly. You had to work with them, struggle with them. You had to do a couple of tests. You you also began to appreciate them. The more you did, you oh okay, and you see things thicker and, and greater. Uh, so there's this there's just this false I think false assumption as to the process of perception and of appreciation. Well, and I absolutely agree. I think that uh, knowledge um, of any kind is so much more solid when you discover it on your own. When you you come to this um, from your own conclusion. Now, mind you, that's not all that reliable um, in, in every way. Personal conclusions are very frequently incorrect. But uh, you know, if somebody just tells me something. Um, and I want to take that on their authority, then I, that's something that the only support that I can possibly have for that is that person's authority. Take, for example, the guest we had last week, Mike Shaw. Um, aside mm -hmm. from him, if he was the only person who spoke about tardigrades, who had ever uh, documented anything about them, and he came on the show to tell us how incredible these creatures are, I might have to accuse him of making it up. I, I mean, it, it, 
may uh, it, it may not be true because I mean a, any evidence that what he's saying is true is all coming from him and exclusively from him. Luckily, in Mike's case, he has photos, he has all kinds of documents, he has thousands of other scientists. I mean, he's he's done this because of their research. It's built upon it. So it's not coming from his authority. It's coming from the authority of photos and of of documented uh, experiments and, and from videos and, and the peer preserved review. specimens. And it's... Yeah. You know, Greg, uh, there's one other thing that I, that occurs to me, even from the text of Scripture, that um, that that I would think that somebody uh, offering that argument of knowledge, you know, knowing somebody who knows everything, uh, is that in the, the chapter that is often very, look, very looked at, the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, where, you know, it talks about, you know, uh, what love is like. As that chapter comes to an end, it says, uh, you know, uh, you know, now we uh, we know in part and we speak in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. And it talks about, you know, like when I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the childish things. Well, anyway, it, as it goes on, it, it talks about how today in this world, we're kind of like the child versus the adult who now knows as we see through a, a, a dimmed glass. We, we, we just know in part, and we, when we talk, we only know a little bit about what we're saying. And so it seems to me that the text of Scripture itself claims that the Christian does not know everything, that the Christian doesn't even know everything about what it is that, that supposedly God is showing them. So I, I think that um, there's a part of, uh, of of his argument that is almost unbiblical. <laughs> Unfortunately, not That's only illogical, point. but unbiblical. I may have talked to him about that one. I uh, I also um, yeah, I'm you're going to see him one, talk to him about that. First Corinthians cited. chapter thirteen verses eight through thirteen might be interesting. Yeah, that's uh, I First Corinthians. I've certainly heard that one enough times. Actually, it was mentioned during my own wedding when uh, the the priest who was performing the the ceremony uh, was talking about in the the homily how refreshing it was to have a wedding that didn't use that scripture. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I I certainly I'm familiar with it, and I I always thought it was interesting when when it went beyond just the what love is into the the second part there because I don't see how that fits in with the wedding context um but uh you're right it's it that does make a very interesting point um about the our ability to know and our ability to reason however isn't there another scripture that says um that we all know that there is a god that that's implanted within us in some way or that we're born knowing that I, I don't. Yeah, Eric even talked about that. Um, he claimed that from Romans chapter one, I believe it was, that uh, God has made it obvious to him that that certain things about God are self-evident, and that we have turned away from it. He claimed that there was this innate knowledge, um, and al although I think that there is something similar to what he was talking about that I see as the purpose of that text. Um, that's what he was talking about from there, talking about how, you know, God made it obvious to us through creation and through natural revelation that we can actually really know there is a God, and we all do know this, and we're just living in suppressing the truth if we don't acknowledge it. That's a very common... Um, uh, yeah, I've certainly heard the argument made before. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to say, we have a viewer comment here. I think it's fantastic. This is going back a little bit to talking about the... Um, the axioms or first principles, the, that which uh, it, it, the starting points from which we reason or the worldviews, as uh, Eric uh, was talking about it. But um, it, the, the comment says, and I don't have a name for who this commenter was, but it's a fantastic comment. Thank you. Um, it says, if we begin with a premise to find out if it follows through to a logical conclusion, uh, then its very purpose is to be disproven. Not all premises that we begin with are incapable of being disproven, nor intended to be impenetrable. Um, so it's possible to begin with the premise that God exists, simply to find out if it follows through to a logical conclusion. Um, the viewer then uh, clarified in saying, what I'm saying is, er, uh, this is what I'm saying. Axioms are not um, always intended to be pillars of unwavering truth. Actually, that, that might be allowed intended now i think it's, it's supposed to mean always but always intended to be pillars of unwavering truth and i'd absolutely have to agree i think that uh that's when i talk about the the null hypothesis um that's exactly what i mean in science when you write a hypothesis 
if it is not a testable statement, it is supposed to be. It's a it's a an axiom. You're saying this is true, and then you test it because without tests, anything can be true. Um, so the God hypothesis. And I would um, say that it's also there's probably a lot of things that are true that can't be tested, but we just can't verify or validate that they're true. That's absolutely true. But not every statement is it, not every statement is even testable. But um, in science, at least, uh, that which is not testable is a poorly uh, written hypothesis. That's that's not a hypothesis at all. It's simply a statement. Um, so, and I think that that's what this is getting to. I might be wrong. Forgive me, viewer, if uh, I'm interpreting this wrong uh, wrongly. But it says, uh, you know, if we begin with a premise to find out if it follows through to a logical conclusion, then its very purpose is to be disproven. Um, so we can do that with uh, the with the premise that God exists. Um, so I, I have a question, I, and I, this is a question that I've seen before: is what would we expect the world to look like if the God of the Bible existed? If if the the young Earth creationist ideology is absolutely true, if the world is six thousand years old and people and dinosaurs coexisted, what would we expect the world to look like if that was the case? Um, hmm. And I think that that Eric and, and his father and Ken Ham and some of the other um, people of this movement have done a, a fantastic job going through some mental gymnastics to make uh, the science – or to interpret the science in a way that makes it allowable in some uh, understanding. Uh, but you've got to make some pretty big leaps. You, we would have to see that this massive amount of water essentially came from nowhere – and went away to nowhere, and it, and that humans and dinosaurs, uh, um, if we did coexist, it, you'd think that the the early cave paintings that we had would depict something of that nature, or that yeah. you know we'd find human remains inside of the stomach of a dinosaur, or a, a, there's so many things that we we would expect to be the case, and they're not. So I mean, based on that premise. Or the test of that premise, I'd have to say it can't be true. Yeah, I can tell you where they think the water is and where it came from. Where Where is it? Uh, what What is well, the answer? They They um, a lot of them would uh, would would argue that uh, as the Earth uh, as time goes on, that some of this uh, water becomes uh, you know hydrogen, as it were, and just kind of drifts off into space. But uh, it, it is believed by many uh, biblicists that the earth was at one time a terrarium where there was uh, in the upper atmosphere a bubble of water that also the, wa the earth was actually inside a bubble. And that the bubble burst and the waters came down and that's where the, uh, the worldwide flood came from. And then uh, the world being a terrarium because it's inside of this bubble, then poles begin to freeze and the water uh, gets soaked up into the ice on the poles. And a lot of them would believe that that's where the water went and where it came from was the bubble around the earth. Huh. Well, you know, that that's that's interesting. And that would be another one of those premises that would would have things that, uh, you know, would lead to. Or we could ask, what would we expect to happen if if it was that is the Grand case, Canyon would, would be an example of that. And I mean, what we would expect from something like that was that water, um, uh, of course, has optical qualities and it would make a much, much dimmer Earth. Um, you know, we'd have to have uh, probably, I'm guessing, several miles worth of water in this barrier. And I'd uh, I'd be hard pressed to to imagine any light making through or uh, several miles worth of water. Um, well, uh, even so, the greenhouse there. effect would be enormous. I, I, I would have think. To yeah. yeah. Uh, the bubble would be uh, the bubble could be rather thin thin when it's that far out but yeah, um, i guess it does depend on how far out it is yeah but it uh i, I mean to me it's a it's, it's an interesting theory but i i i think that you as you mentioned you know the uh, the greenhouse effect and all that we could we could probably even predict what that would be like but anyway i mean they do have answers for these things it's not as if they haven't been asked these questions and they they haven't thought of some ideas uh but there well, is no, not what i'm saying say, i think they've done a fantastic job with making things up i mean these are ad hoc explanations and they they make i mean i was watching this presentation yesterday these presentations and i have to say if i didn't know better they'd seem convincing if i was not a scientist i, right. I understand how this this comes about and i that's a big clue 
That's a big clue if you were not a scientist. And <laughs> this is the one thing – this this is one of the hard things that anybody who's an expert has. Uh, you know, If you're an expert at anything, the moment you're talking to people who are not an expert – you are in a powerful position of manipulation and deception. Uh, you know, so that, this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, a lot of scientists talk to other scientists, you know, and, and they're not really even interested in getting involved in the stupidity of an argument or an idea that is well accepted among scientists. You know, I, I, can understand that, and I know that uh, that's that's often also been thrown at them. I know uh, Dinesh just or no, not Dinesh, uh, Deepak Chopra uh, just did a uh, uh, Clint Eastwood style debate against uh, um, Richard Dawkins, who refused to show up for the debate. So uh, Deepak Chopra debated in an empty chair, um, and the the reason that Dawkins said that he didn't want to do the debate is because it's been done, and because that the goal of these debates is not to to listen, to show anything. Um, now, I, I guess uh, we only have about a minute left, and I, I do need to wrap it up, but I wanted to say um, that uh, we we also have another um, interesting dynamic on this show is that we, we, we don't debate per se, we discuss, and that's I don't think that it's worthless. I, I don't think we're wasting our time in doing that, but when when we bring guests on, it, it's very unlikely that there's suddenly going to be a aha moment, and they're going to switch uh, the, their entire worldview. But I want to expose our audience and our viewers to all of these ideas. And the one thing that I ask is that you don't take anything that I say at face value. You don't listen to me when I ap appeal to authority. But I try to avoid doing that. But you know, I, I think that. That's a dangerous way of reasoning, that if I say something, I would love nothing better than to have viewers sending in messages saying, here's how you were wrong with that. You know, email us, send me a text message or send it in. Um, but that's, that's what I want is, is the skepticism, people giving their, their own opinions and researching, digging for the facts. That is intellectual honesty. That's what we are fighting for. Um, without, without skepticism, without reading or researching things your own there is no such thing as as honesty it's authority um and with that it all comes down to trust in, in the honesty and the ability of that authority um so i i did want to say or next week we do have um a guest coming on who uh his name is augustine astasio um I, i'm hoping i pronounced that right i'm going with the um pronunciation i'd imagine comes but uh um this may be another one of the conversations like that augustine uh he is an apologist um and you know don't take what i say to him on face value don't take what bob says to him on face value research what we talk about look into it and please if something doesn't seem right send us messages i'd love to let him know that uh it's not just me and bob um coming up with our criticisms so i'm gonna sign off bob is there anything else that you want to say before we go no, I'm glad you had a chance to visit the uh, uh, visit that event, and also I uh, just want to make one correction: you should listen to me. <laughs> right, I, I'm sorry. When I say we should not uh, respect or appeals to authority um, are not valid. I mean, other than Bob's, uh, obviously Bob <laughs> is the authority. Um, and uh, with that, we'll close with a, a quick nod to the authority that is Bob. Um, thank you. This has been Inspiring Honesty. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back or be back next week at 6 o'clock um, or next Sunday night. And uh, ne we will be joined by Augustine Astacio for uh, another fantastic conversation. I'll be getting in touch with him here uh, tomorrow to figure out exactly what we'll be talking about. Um, thank you for joining us. Have a great night. <laughs>